I wanted this to be a meeting of people who were on the same page, who believed that student press freedom was important, and that free expression legislation was one way, not by any means the only way, but one way to uh, uh, achieve that end. You know, and in relating to that, I, I thought about what was sort of like the underlying principle of what I believed and, and what I think many of you in the organizations you represent believe. And John Bowen and I have talked about this before, but I was as struck as I've been by anything in my you know, career working with scholastic journalism of th by this quote from um, the Federal District Court decision in Dean versus Utica Schools. Um, and you can read it yourself there, but it, it to me, I think, summarizes most succinctly the notion of why press freedom for scholastic journalism is important. We're preparing journalists and we're preparing citizens. Um, and journalism requires questioning those in power. Um, that, I think, is really a valuable point. And one of the things we're going to discuss later in the day is what collectively can we do as individuals and as organizations to show our support, not specifically for um, student press freedom, but, or excuse me, for student free press legislation, but for student press freedom in general. Um, and I think this is a good starting point for understanding and appreciating and expressing what are sort of fundamental values. All right, well, on to the issue of student press freedom legislation specifically. You know, the thing that I think really brought it all home, and I, and, and I know Mike as well remembers this day, um, well actually Mike wasn't at the SPLC yet, it seems as if he was, um, but many of us in this room remember that day very vividly, January 13, 1988, when the Supreme Court handed down its decision in the Hazelwood School District case, and suddenly attention was focused on the fact that California had a state statute that had been on the books since the mid-1970s um, that protected student free press rights. And as I said many times after um, that, you know, this law was largely ignored until the time of the Hazelwood ruling. Not entirely, there were some cases about it, but largely ignored because of the belief that it was redundant. It was only duplicative of the rights that were already protected by the First Amendment. Well, when that um, decision was handed down in 1988, suddenly it took on new importance. And um, as this quote from the State Commissioner of Education made clear that, you know, students in California still enjoy sp uh, significant free expression protections because of this state law. What the Supreme Court did was define the protections of the First Amendment. The court did not, and in fact could not, um, limit the protections that states themselves might choose to give to school officials. Well, as a result of California, um, the other states began to act, and as many of you will remember, it was just a few months later that Massachusetts um, passed a law um, sponsored by Representative Nicholas Pale Paleologos. I remember him so well because he described how he had been a censored editor in high school and how that prompted him to, after hearing about Hazelwood, not even knowing about California, to introduce a bill to make a provision in the um, Massachusetts statutes mandatory that had previously only been optional. Um, and by May of, or excuse me, June of 1988, we had the first post-Hazelwood um, student free expression law. Um, Mary, I know, is going to talk later um, about some of her experiences in Iowa, which began in 1988, took two years, but by 89 joined the list. Followed in 1990 by Colorado, Kansas in 92, Arkansas in 94, and then the long dry spell. The time post-Columbine, when people, myself included, wondered would it be possible again for this kind of legislation to happen. And then Oregon came back in 2007 and I think sort of gave new hope. We're going to talk more about that in a second, why that happened. Um, you know, the one goal, I think, of all these laws was to return the law to the place it had been before the Hazelwood decision. To say that the Tinker Standard created a reasonable balance between school officials and student journalists relating to their rights to determine the content of their student publications and to express themselves freely in school, even when the student expression was school-sponsored. 
Well, you know, at the same time we had those successes, there were many, um, I, I don't want to say failures, but many successes mm -hmm. yet to, to happen. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, you'll see the list here, 24 states in the course of, you know, the years from 1988 until today have considered legislation, um, had bills actually introduced and, and um, not been able to get them made into law. And I know many of you in this room were involved in one or more of these efforts. And um, I, I hope we'll, we'll get the opportunity to gain some wisdom from, from you about that experience. <coughs> I still think it's remarkable, though, going back to Warren's comment about shield laws, that the fact that an issue that only impacts people who, for the most part, can't vote, and when they can, they don't, um, that the state legislatures in 24 states have found this important enough to actually consider, even if they didn't pass the bills, is I think a testimonial to the fact that there is some realization out there this is important. Um, you know, what actually prompted the impetus that brought about Oregon and I think sort of the revitalized effort that we're seeing or at least hoping for today. And that, I believe, was the decision in Hostie versus Carter in 2005, the college press censorship case that heightened awareness to the fact that, you know, censorship isn't just a problem for high school media, but for college media as well. This decision by the Federal Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals, I think, prompted new concerns and actual censorship as well as threats of it. Um, you know, in 2006 and 2008, um, California, thanks to Senator Yee, amended their existing statutes um, to provide more explicit protections for college press freedom and, as we know, specifically for advisors and other school employees who were punished because of what students um, uh, published or expressed. Um, and in California, interestingly enough, many of you recall this, it happened because a lawyer for the California State University system um, wrote a memo describing the Hostie ruling and saying, and sent it to all the presidents of the California State University system saying, this may indicate that we have greater authority to control student media than we thought we had. Well, that sent the red flag up, that prompted concerns in California um, that, that encouraged many people, Jim Ewart is one example of those, to support this effort and persuade Senator Yee to make it happen. Um, Oregon in 2007, um, um, a law protecting both high school and college uh, media, um, and Illinois, a college-only law in 2007. You know, this day is really going to focus on these state laws as they relate to high school journalism. Um, James, had, coming from Illinois, I, I think can talk to us a little bit about the experience there um, with their state law. But I do think we, one of the issues for us to discuss is how these two issues relate together. Um, are we more successful as allies, um, or should the efforts be independent of each other? Um, plans for the future. You know, we're really lucky to have Josh Moore here from Kentucky, who I think deserves probably the biggest gold star of the day for, as a sophomore in college, um, persuading his state legislator to get uh, a bill enacted, um, or, or excuse me, introduced, um, pre-filed. I, I don't want to overstate the case, but it's a great achievement. And you know, when I talked to Josh on the phone about this um, earlier this fall, I, I thought he reminded me so much of our other student in the audience, Brian Schramm, who made a very similar effort in Washington State. And again, although not yet successful, I think has definitely helped change the way people in Washington State, and in fact the entire Pacific Northwest, think about student free expression and student press freedom. Um, as far as I know, those are the only two states where there are active discussions about introducing or reintroducing bills in 2009. But I think that there is definitely a movement afoot in others, and we'll talk more about that later. New opportunities in 2008, that's the question I think that prompted us to decide now's the time. Now this map, which came from the National Conference of State Legislatures, um, just shows those states where the legislature has um, control, majorities, of one single party. The blue are Democratic control of both houses, the red are Republican control of both houses, 
and um, the purple are those where control is divided. Um, this is just the legislature, this isn't the governor's um, office in the state. But what it reflects is, and the next slide will describe this in a little more detail, that there is a new landscape politically that I think could work to the advantage of this case. First of all, Democrats gained control of both houses in four state legislatures that they hadn't had before, um, Delaware, Nevada, New York, and Wisconsin. You know, much to my regret, in many places, this has been perceived as a Democratic issue. But what we've also seen is in some states, Colorado being an excellent example, um, where Republicans were as actively um, um, pursuing and proponents of this effort as the Democrats were. And I would suggest that it isn't just the Democratic controlled state where we have the opportunity here. Any state where there is clearly a party that has strong control of the legislature might be an opportunity for pursuing this. The Republicans gained control in Oklahoma and Tennessee for the first time. Um, possible places where this could happen as well. You know, as mentioned here, there are still a number of states that have split legislative control. Um, and um, in terms of the party, any party controlling both the governor's office and the legislature, um, we've got um, 17 states where that's the case. Again, suggesting maybe it would be a little easier in some of those places. You know, a couple of other things that I think happen politically that are important, and this is something that's not certainly my uh, recognition of this, but many people have commented on the fact that this election seemed to get young people involved in record numbers. I don't know if the statistics are bearing out that they voted, um, perhaps at the level they got involved, but they definitely got involved in campaigns and advocacy. One question I think we want to ask ourselves is how can we tap into that? and actually make that something useful for our particular um, um, effort as well, as an issue that relates directly to their interests. Um, the other thing that I think is of note, although of limited value perhaps, is that we do have some former state legislators who were very supportive of this effort, who now are in more prominent positions. And I just mentioned two of the, the most notable, the president-elect, you know, many of you heard the story from Linda, or excuse me, Susan Tantillo um, of, of Illinois describing um, meeting um, Barack Obama when he was running for the Senate, um, and when she described that she was a former high school journalism teacher, he said, the first comment from her was, it's a shame what happened to our high school student free expression bill in the state legislature, which, as you may recall, passed by large margins in the legislature and then was vetoed by the governor, that he remembered that um, and had clearly supported the bill when it was in the legislature, a reflection of some sense of the value of this by someone who it turns out is going to be very important in all our lives. <laughs> Senator, <laughs> Senator Patty Murray um, of Washington was an early proponent of legislation there as well um, now and for some years now been a member of the U.S. Senate. You know, there also, I think, have been a growing awareness of new concerns and justifications, arguments to be made why student press freedom is important. And you know, one of the things I've asked Warren to talk about this afternoon is, is what the arguments that he believes, given the effort he and Jay Ideas have put into this issue, um, resonate today. Um, because they aren't the same ones that resonated in 1988. Um, you know, one of the things we've talked about is we don't refer to this anymore as anti-Hazelwood legislation, which is the name that we talked about forever. Um, you know, instead of putting the negative spin on it, we're thinking of it as the positive student free expression protection legislation. But first of all, one thing that's changed is, um, and changed the argument, is that college students are involved now too. They're at risk of censorship because of Hostey versus Carter. Not that they weren't always at risk, but the legal protections that they have may be in question because of that ruling. What that does is create the additional legitimacy of those people who are in the older age group. You know, for better or worse, it's easy for many people to dismiss teenagers' um, interests. Um, it's harder for them to do that, not impossible, but harder for them for college students. Secondly, we've got a renewed interest in civics education, citizenship training. I mean, you know, if you look at how many organizations have been created in the last five or seven years focused on issues relating to media literacy or civic education, it's pretty phenomenal. 
those are people that I think potentially could be our allies in this effort, and the advocacy they're engaging in could, I think, help support this as well. Um, you know, Sandy, I, I can't toot her horn enough for supporting Jack Dvorak's research tying academic performance of high school students to participation in student media. Um, you know, academic performance is the name of the game for educational administrators today, and the more closely that we can tie participation in journalism, and more importantly, participation in free journalism, um, uncensored journalism, I think the stronger the argument we're going to have with those who are making decisions um, based on educational policy. The other factor, and you know, I had sort of the sad realization that, yeah, we still have a long way to go in this when we read the Seattle Times editorial mm -hmm. earlier this week, mm -hmm. which I think is in your binder. Um, mm -hmm. But um, today, more than ever, I think there are professional journalists out there that get it. There's certainly organizations. I mean, Diana and, and um, uh, ASNE and um, the um, um, NAA Foundation um, are, are but, you know, two examples. There are people at all levels of the commercial news media that appreciate this is fundamentally important to journalists, to journalism education, and to ensuring people will be out there who are advocates for a free press, not just for students. So that creates opportunity, ultimately, I guess, was, is the way uh, I look at it. So the question that I leave with is where do we go from here? And this is where we're going to start the discussion now.